I'm joined now by military analyst and retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell. Thank you very much for making time for us. Also, New York Times Chief Diplomatic Correspondent Steve Erlanger. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Sean, I will come to you first. Uh, were you shocked at all by these comments? Trump has made a, an issue of NATO in the past. I mean, Rosanna, no, uh, it, it is shocking just the nature of the way that uh, former President Trump delivers some of these messages. Um, thoroughly unhelpful. But actually, when you look below the surface of it, um, we as a nation spend 2% of our GDP on defence. We meet our obligation for NATO. NATO has faced a very uncertain world, what with Russia invading Ukraine and the like. And we are talking in this country about do we up the amount we spend on defence. But part of that obligation is to NATO. And therefore, it's very reasonable that other NATO nations should, as a minimum, pay their way. Defence is an insurance policy against an uncertain future. And with only 11 of the 31 NATO countries currently spending their 2% uh, obligation, which was agreed in 2014 as guidance, but all countries were expected to be there by this year, it's, it's actually helpful to try and encourage countries to pay their way. It's just really unhelpful the way that former President Trump has delivered the message. Yeah, Stephen, coming to you, Sean makes the point there that obviously when you look at the facts, the facts are there. Some countries aren't meeting their obligations. It's probably a discussion worth having. But is it the way that Donald Trump continuously goes about it, the risks diplomacy and risks NATO? Well, Trump likes to vamp. He likes to invent tales where he's the boss and people call him sir. Um, so this was one of those. And then he gets in the mood of his audience. So what he said was pretty awful. I think it shook quite a lot of people. I don't think that, that does he really mean it? One never knows. I mean, Trump as president behaved rather more responsibly. Um, I think the best thing European countries can do is spend more money on defense. Um, as Sean said quite rightly, certainly since 2014, uh, NATO's military um, NATO's military defense spending has gone way up. Uh, Germany will make 2% this year for the first time in, a, in a, a very long time. And other countries are on the way. And Trump seems to be just obsessed with this wrong notion that NATO is a club and you have to pay dues. Um, but, it, you know, we've got a long way to go till the election. It's not a given that he's going to win. And he does say a lot of strange things off the cuff that um, you never know whether he's serious or not. He does, he does think our allies in NATO get a free ride on the basis of us. He's felt that for 35 years, ever since I met him in the 80s. Um, and he gets these ide fix and he doesn't listen to those who try to explain to him that NATO isn't a club and there aren't dues and nobody know, owes the United States money. It's but this not, is his motion. Yeah, it's not membership of Mar-a-Lago, is it? Look, Stephen, I'll come back to you shortly, but just want to cross over to uh, Sean on that point of these being awful comments. The concern is, of course, that these types of comments, um, you know, requesting an attack on NATO members that don't pay, plays into the hands of people like Putin, who, of course, has waged a war off the back of saying that Putin was an aggressor to them. I mean, how dangerous are the comments? Well, as I, I mean, to be blunt, I think we make more of them than probably President Putin will. I, I hardly think it's likely President Putin is going to take that as an invitation to go and walk into another uh, country. Um, frankly, Russia has got uh, had its fingers badly burnt in Ukraine. It's in no fit state to cause a threat to any other nation in any, any time soon. I think the point that's made, though, is that, you know, the US spends about three and a half percent of its GDP uh, on defence. It is the one of the world's superpowers, not the world superpower. And I think um, President Trump has always put, tried to put a USA first moniker on this. And I think I always try and look at the positives here, because frankly, in US uh, presidential elections, there's spears thrown all over the place and sometimes they're thrown for effect. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that this is going to fundamentally challenge the foundations of NATO. It's a very robust organisation. It's been around for a long time. And with the attacks on its uh, on its perimeter by Russia, a lot of countries in Europe are now stepping up their game. It is unhelpful, but frankly, as a Brit, I am also looking to try and make sure that we don't have to pay more than our fair share into NATO, which is what we we rely on it for part of our collective alliance. And therefore, in the in the round, 
I think it will be helpful if other nations step up. But it's thoroughly unhelpful language, and I suspect it won't do Trump any good in the, in the near term. Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, thank you very much for joining us. And Stephen Erlanger, please stay with us. We'll come over to you for your US expertise now, because there's more stuff on the presidential uh, front, which is causing some consternation over there at the moment. I think you could say a colossal 86% of American voters believe that the 81-year-old President Biden is now too old for another term in office. We've been talking about this on and off for a long time, but I think now, given uh, some of the moments we watched last week, in fact, let's remind ourselves of this one. Initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Then we've got a confusion about foreign leaders uh, later trying to tidy it up. I mean, is it really uh, the fact that it's too late now and he needs to stand down? Well, I can't judge that. I do know that he has trouble with certain memories. Uh, I do know his aides are spinning around saying, no, no, you have to know in meetings he's terrific. They're obviously covering over some of these deficiencies. And during the campaign, they're, they're trying to hide him. He's doing very few live performances. He's given very few live press conferences. Um, when he was elected in 2016, there was COVID, so he had an excuse for running from behind a camera. That's going to be harder this time. Trump has been having all kinds of age-related deficiencies too, but looks hardier and hailer. Um, but, you know, Biden will have to make this decision. I think he thinks he's the only one who, who can actually beat Trump, and he thinks Trump is a clear and present danger to the republic. But if Biden's wife, Dr. Jill Biden, thinks the next four years are going to be too difficult, he might actually listen to her. If he decides not to run, there's still time for the Democratic Party to come up with someone else. But I don't really expect that to happen. In the spirit of fairness, uh, Stephen, you're right. Uh, Trump has had his own uh, senior-related confusions as well. Here his is one senior of, moments. His senior yeah. moments. Here is one of them. Right. By the way, they never report the crowd on January 6th. Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, so whatever they want. They turned it down. They don't want to talk about that. In case any viewers are wondering, it was Democrat Nancy Pelosi in charge of security, not Nikki Haley, that Republican candidate. Uh, and, you know, whether it's senior-related or anything else related, people make mistakes. But I think people are beginning to pick up on some of the frequency of these. Were you surprised at all that The New York Times, of all publications, came out to uh, raise questions around Biden's age? No, I mean, in fact, I think um, some of our columnists have already done it um, as an editorial statement, I thought it was pretty well judged and maybe, in my view, a bit late. I mean, I think it is a real issue um, and we need to raise all these issues properly and do it in a, in a balanced way. Um, and I think we've tried to do that, but for the editorial board to raise these questions, that was a change, I agree. Stephen Erlanger, Chief Diplomatic Correspondent, New York Times. We appreciate it.